Welcome to the Tampa Bay History Center. My name is Rodney Kite Powell, and I am the director of the Touchdown, Touchdown Library, Map Library, here at the History Center. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all to uh, another a great uh, Flora Conversations lecture. So uh, to get some of the uh, business out of the way, I'll say Flora Conversations is presented in person and stream live on Zoom and Facebook live from the History Center's Tico Hall, thanks to the support of TBHC Endowment Fund at USF and USF Libraries Florida Studies Center with media support provided by WUSF Public Media. And uh, as I mentioned in that, uh, that uh, thank you, uh, we are both live in person here at the History Center as well as streaming live. And uh, the benefit of streaming live is this can then be recorded and then be available for, uh, for use after the fact. So all of you who are here in person, those of you who are watching at home, you can watch this again if you missed a part. And for those who haven't seen it and you talk to, to folks about it afterward, please feel free to share the fact that this event happened and that you can go on the History Center's website uh, and our YouTube channel and you can, uh, you can find this. So, uh, as I mentioned, this is part of our Florida Conversations lecture series, which we have done in partnership with USF for over a dozen years now. And this is the last uh, lecture for our fall lineup, but we have a whole slate in the spring for you guys as well. So a uh, quick rundown of what that is. This information is also available on the History Center's website, or will be uh, soon. But uh, in January, to go along with our uh, annual Gasparilla celebration, which will be back uh, in 2022, we have on January 19th, uh, author uh, Robert Jacob, and he will be talking about Pirates of the Florida Coast, Truths, Legends, and Myths, and up to you to see where Jose Gaspar falls within those three words. Uh, on February 16th, in celebration of uh, Black History Month, one of the many things we're doing here at the History Center, is a, uh, a panel discussion uh, led by uh, Dr. Antoinette Jackson, who is the chair of USF's Department of Anthropology, and her talk will be on African American Burial Grounds and Remembering Project. Uh, really focusing on the, uh, the rediscovered cemeteries in Hillsborough and Pinellas counties uh, that have come to light over the past few years. So a really uh, interesting discussion, panel discussion with that. In March, uh, we have a, a talk entitled Sun Coast Empire, Bertha Onro Palmer, Her Family and the Rise of Sarasota, uh, presented by Dr. Frank Castle. And then April 13th, to go along with our Cuban Pathways exhibit, which actually opens in February, February 11th, uh, we will have a discussion with the, uh, the curator of that exhibition and the curator of the History Center, Dr. Brad Massey, along with uh, one of the History Center's board members, uh, Marucci Azarin. Uh, and and uh, the, the exhibit itself covers 500 years of Cuban and Florida history. And of course, one of the more important aspects of that is the, from the mid 20th century on, and all of the, the immigrants who came from Cuba trying to flee Castro, and uh, Marucci's family was among those folks who did that. And actually, her family's property was nationalized in Cuba by Castro's government, uh, and they were able to uh, recover documents that relate to that, so those will be in the exhibition. And that is in the future, and we're now gonna talk about what's in the present, and of course, what is in the past. And so what that is, is uh, uh, Austin Bell and this book, The Nine Lives of Florida's Famous Key Marco Cat. Austin Bell, a proud University of Florida graduate, go Gators, is uh, the curator of collections at the uh, Marco Island Historical Society, as well as a scholar at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And so without any further ado, I'll bring you Austin Bell. Hi, everybody. Hi, how's everybody doing tonight? Good, good. Well, I'm so honored and grateful to be here and excited to share with you a little bit of information from our world down on Marco Island. Um, and I'm going to be talking, of course, about a very famous artifact, the Key Marco Cat. And more specifically, I'm going to be talking about the life of the cat during the past 500 plus years, uh, from the moment it was first created to its place now. Uh, temporarily on loan at the Marco Island Historical Museum. And I've put little brochures and pens out on your seats. Hopefully you all got one. And there's some stickers on the back table, too, if you want to take one after the talk. Um, and uh, how many of you have been to Marco Island before? Anybody? 
few people. Okay. Oh, at least like half people. That's great. Um, well, if you haven't been to the museum, I'm pleased to share that the cat uh, and several other artifacts from the University of Pennsylvania are actually going to be on loan uh, through April 2026 now. They were originally going to go back this past April, but we extended the loan for another five years. So if you don't have any plans for the next five years or so, maybe try to squeeze a weekend down on Marco Island, go to the beach, and stop over at the museum and, and see the cat, because it's the exhibit is free. Um, and who knows where, when the next time it'll be back in its home state of Florida uh, after that. It's about a three-hour drive uh, from here to Marco Island. Uh, and most of what I'll be talking about today comes out of my new book, uh, The Nine Lives of Florida's Famous Key Marco Cat, uh, which I believe they're going to be selling here in the gift shop. Um, and so uh, this whole talk will be basically what, um, based on the research that came out of putting this book together. Okay. So uh, it's really been one of the great joys of my life to be drawn into the orbit of the Key Marco cat. And in a lot of, the way, a lot of ways, it's kind of felt a little bit predetermined. Um, now, regrettably, I'm a Florida native, but it took me 21 years of living in Florida to even first find out about the cat and the Key Marco site. I'm 36 now, so that's more than half of my life. And only then, because I was volunteering in the anthropology division at the Florida Museum of Natural History, where a substantial portion of this collection is housed. Um, and so in 2009, after my volunteer gig had turned into a part-time job, I was asked to conduct an inventory of that collection. And all I knew at the time was uh, you know, that it was incredibly fragile and important and cool. Uh, but little did I know that uh, Construction was already underway on the Marco Island Historical Museum, which would be a new facility just down the road from where the sites originated. And um, so four years later, and, and a few gray hairs, and definitely a few extra pounds later, and in a master's degree, I was asked to be the curator of collections for the Marco Island Historical Society, where I'd spend the better part of the next decade in pursuit of the cat. Uh, because the cat, it seemed, was actually one of the primary reasons for building this museum on Marco Island in hopes of someday luring it home on loan uh, to, from the Smithsonian to Marco Island, its place of origin. So you could call that a form of museum catnip, if you will. <laughs> now, in the realm of North American archaeology, few artifacts hold as much power and mystique as Florida's famous Key Marco cat. Uh, you know, a lot of times sites are more well known in America than the individual contents uh, of their remains, and most materials recovered uh, are derived from more durable sources like clay and shell and stone. When ephemeral or organic materials uh, are recovered from Native American archaeological sites, uh, such as the Key Marco Cat or Northwest Coast Basketry or a dugout canoe washed up by Hurricane Irma, uh, the story often makes national news headlines. And as museum objects go, few have had a more fascinating trajectory than the cat. Uh, the charismatic wooden object has resided at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History for the past century. It's probably Florida's most famous archaeological artifact. And it was excavated from a waterlogged archaeological site on Marco Island in, uh, on March 5, 1896, by legendary anthropologist Frank Hamilton Cushing. Uh, and since that fateful day, the object really has taken on new meanings uh, and new lives while subtly revealing clues about its former ones. And you can see the location of the Key Marco site on the map here. It's in the north uh, part of Marco Island in what's known as Old Marco, as well as the excavation uh, location. And then the, the uh, museum is the little red star in the center of the island there. And there's actually a picture of the excavation prior to, or, uh, of the site prior to its excavation in 1896. So, partially for the sake of just organizational humor, but truthfully, because there are so many stories to tell, my book has been organized into nine different chapters, as you might expect, each uh, representing a different life uh, in the history of the object. And uh, obviously, the true number of lives isn't really so neatly fixed or easily defined, but um, this is basically the outline I'm going to talk, uh, use in my talk today, which runs, I've practiced, it's about an hour long. I'm sorry it's not shorter than that. It was an hour and a half, so maybe we'll get underneath an hour if we're lucky here, uh, but I'll do my best. 
So every object has an origin story, and in museums, the story of an object's life is generally referred to as provenance, which literally means place of origin, uh, but in museums it more commonly means history of ownership. But very few object provenances start at the very beginning, uh, where the raw materials that became the object uh, first existed in their original forms. And the Key Marco cat really began as a simple plant, uh, and likely a native species of tree or bush still found in southwest Florida, and it grew slowly in its natural habitat for years or even decades before being collected. Uh, and at some point, whether through coincidence or a deliberate search, a human being encountered this plant uh, or its remains and decided that it would make the perfect material from which to build the now iconic figure. So what kind of plant was it made from? Well, this is a very uh, frustratingly difficult question to answer. We've had, uh, before the loan to our museum, we had the botanists at the Smithsonian uh, Department look at it. We've had other botanists look at it. Nobody can tell just by looking at the surface of the cat what kind of wood it was made from. Uh, but one of the most obvious facts is it was made from a single piece of wood. Uh, there's been two uh, botanical studies of the Key Marco collection, which there are more than a thousand artifacts from. Uh, during the past century, Cent cypress and pine were the two most abundant species, along with 11 other species listed on the left there. Uh, and then these species generally align with those found at a more thoroughly studied site, Pineland, which is about 50 miles north of Marco in Lee County, uh, where they've done great archaeological research. Uh, and so there's additional species there uh, that could be considered. And all of these plants, um, except for Lignum vitae, still grow wild on Marco Island. Uh, and then I've also listed several other candidates there for other reasons, which I go into greater detail about in my book, um, and I'll spare you those. But, um, you know, one of, the, uh, one of these species is basically probably the one used to carve the cat. And some are more likely than others. I mean, palmetto was found at the site, but obviously the cat wasn't carved from a palmetto tree. Uh, but narrowing it down further really is tough because, uh, you know, in the case of the Key Marco wood IDs on the left there, those were done in 1988, and they were done through what's called destructive analysis, where thin sections of wooden artifacts were taken uh, and destroyed in order to look at them on a cellular level, which obviously the Smithsonian is not keen to do to such a you know, priceless artifact like the Key Marco cat. So for now, the cat's wood type uh, remains a mystery. Now the question of who exactly carved it is also largely un unclear and on numerous levels. Uh, uncertainty surrounding its age as well as, of course, lack of documentation from the pre-Columbian Americas make identifying an individual artist impossible. Um, the best attribution at this point is largely uh, made to the Calusa of southwest Florida, um, and even that designation is potentially problematic because people who lived, who lived on Marco Island after about 500 BC were part of a cultural area known to archaeologists as the Glades region, which is based largely on ceramics. Um, and Marco Island, as you can see on the map there, is on the northernmost boundary of the Glades region and just south of the Calusahatchee region, which is typically thought of more as the heart of the proto-historic uh, Calusa. And uh, after about 500 AD, Calusahatchee pottery is mostly plain or undecorated, but on Marco Island, a lot of the uh, uh, pottery is decorated with unique designs that originate only in the Glades region. Uh, and so those found at Calusahatchee sites to the north uh, are found less generally. And so the only type that's found in both regions with consistency is glades tooled, which first appears uh, after about 1350 AD. And after that point, the pottery in both regions starts to look more similar. So archeologists archeolo believe that around that time, the increasingly powerful Calusa to the north uh, either allied with or absorbed or even replaced the people uh, uh, the Glades people on what is now Marco Island. So depending on when the cat was made, whether it was before or after A.D. 1350, it may have well been made by a Glades person rather than a Calusa. So where was the cat made? Well, early uh, European maps and written accounts of a place called Muspa likely refer to the Marco Island area. 
So consequently, a lot of times, uh, Marco Island's Glades residents are referred to as the Musba or the Musba Indians. And uh, one of the earliest known primary sources that mentions this place is the 1575 mem memoirs of Hernando de Escalante Fontaneda, who was shipwrecked in 1549 at the age of 13 uh, off the coast of Florida. And he lived amongst the Calusa as their captive for 17 years. And according to him, the town of Musba was just one of many under the uh, Calusa domain. And you see the, the word uh, continue in Spanish documents into the late 1600s and on maps into the 1700s, one of which is uh, pictured on the right there. And it places the location of Musba in the southwest cor uh, portion of the peninsula. Now, obviously these maps are inaccurate and it's difficult to know the exact location, but uh, some historical records offer clues. And there's a 1575 report by Juan Lopez de Velasco uh, that gives us some geographic details, including a description of three little groves, which are very likely these high sand dunes above or around Barfield Bay on Marco Island. Uh, it's very unusual in its elevation, more than 50 feet high, it, which in southwest Florida is a mountain. Um, and, you know, um, so that is very likely why archaeologists believe this area is likely to be Muspa. And so uh, it may well have referred to the entire Marco Island area or a specific site like Key Marco, um, but there's, there are other major sites on Marco Island as well that, it, that Muspa could have been referring to. Um, but all this is to say, regardless of who is to credit, the cat in all likelihood came from a place that at one time was known as Muspa. So, you know, maybe we should be calling it the Muspa cat. I don't know. So chapter two, springing to life. This talks about the process by which the Key Marco cat was made. And it was obviously probably very labor intensive and could well have been a team effort. Um, for instance, one person with specialized knowledge or skills may have collected the wood, another may have prepared it, and another may have actually performed the detailed carving work, or one person could have done everything. Uh, and we really don't have any way of knowing, you know, the circumstances under which it was made, but we can look to other cultures for comparison. Uh, for example, in the 1500s, the Yucatan Maya actually commissioned specialists to produce wooden idols by way of this of a ritualized process um, after which they received compensation for their work. So maybe the person or persons who were responsible for the cat were somehow rewarded for their work. They might have uh, instead also been commanded or frightened or threatened into doing so by some higher authority, whether it be social, political, religious authority. Uh, but uh, they could have also just felt inspired one day. Maybe they really liked cats. Uh, while we can't know, you know, whom or whom specifically made the cat, nor can we know their motivations, just attempting to reconstruct the process a little bit by which it was made lends us a little bit of greater appreciation for the arduous efforts that likely resulted in its ex existence. So the cat itself, there's a good picture of it, uh, stands just a whisker underneath six inches in height. It's pretty small. A lot of people come to the museum expecting something really big and they, and they have to strain their eyes just to see it. Um, and it weighs less than one half pound, uh, which is about equivalent to a half empty or half full, if you're an optimist, uh, 12 ounce aluminum beverage can. So if you can imagine the weight of that, that's how much the cat weighs. Um, and so if you think about the figure's final size, it's interesting to think about why it was sized that way. Was it a product of limitations, say, to, due to the size of the source wood? Uh, was it designed for a specific location, say, to sit on a piece of furniture? Uh, was it designed to be handheld or used as a toy, like a modern-day action figure? Uh, any number of practical, personal, or spiritual considerations could have influenced its size. And uh, of all the known pre-Columbian wooden figures from South Florida, and there aren't that many, uh, the cat is by far the most finely polished, and at least in its current condition. And uh, it's almost entirely symmetrical across a central vertical plane from head to toe, as you can see there. Uh, and it depicts a crouching or seated, seated uh, human feline form. So it's considered anthropomorphic, meaning it has both human-like and animal-like uh, characteristics.
So in all likelihood, there were a number of tools used in the cat's production. The Glades and Calusa cultures were prolific shell tool manufacturers. And uh, so a wood collector might have been on the lookout for wood that, say, required less investment of physical labor, such as from a naturally fallen or fragmented tree. Uh, but more likely, cost was of little importance, um, especially when it came to making the cat, because you know, uh, they might have even selected a living tree on purpose just to reinforce life or other worldly qualities in the cat. And there's precedent for that. For example, the Iroquois carved false face masks from living trees, uh, believing it reinforces life in the masks. Um, so again, it's impossible to know the original context, but the collector might have used a specialized tool to collect it, uh, much the way you might pick a Phillips head uh, or a flathead screwdriver the Glades or Calusa wood collector might have used a certain type of, uh, certain type of shell tool uh, because there are more than 50 known types. Um, and, uh, you know, they might have also used fire to help shape the wood uh, as well as shark skin, uh, which when wet acts as sort of a flexible sandpaper. And they actually found examples of that at the site uh, very near where the Key Marco cat was found. So once the source wood was collected and transported and shaped and ready for carving, uh, the person or persons responsible for making it likely used a shark tooth tool uh, for the fine detail work. And we know that because shark tooth tools were found at the site as well. And there's pictures of them there on the top left. Um, and the handles all varied in size and uh, may have been used for different levels of detail, even with different species of sharks. Uh, represented, much the way, you know, a painter might select a broad or narrow paintbrush, uh, uh, depending on the level of work being done. And then soon after his excavation at Key Marco, Cushing speculated that the cat uh, might have been anointed with some kind of varnish or probably had been frequently anointed with the fat of slain animals or victims, is how he puts it. To, to this, doubtly, its remarkable preservation is due for it's still relatively heavier, harder, and less shrunken by drying than any other specimen of like material in the collection. Um, so if Cushing's suspicion was correct, that actually was probably one of the final steps in the cat's preparation. And there's an artist's illustration of what that might have looked like uh, on the right there. So we've learned a little bit about how it might have been created. But now we get to the big question. The hard question, why? Why was the Key Marco cat created in the first place? And what did it mean? What purpose did it serve? And the interpretations range from the mundane, like being a piece of furniture, to the mystical, like being a living deity. Uh, and while the cat's true purpose is probably the most important bit of information to know about the object, it's also the most frustratingly elusive almost certainly uh, impossible to ever truly figure out. But we do have some ideas, and we'll go through those uh, quickly. First of all, the most basic interpretation of the cat lies right in its name, right? I mean, at this point, it's assumed to at least partially be a feline. But there's no irrefutable proof that the cat is a cat at all. It's just a basic assumption. And I've had people come to me saying that it looks more like a squirrel or even a flying bat uh, than a cat. Um, but if the cat is indeed a cat, and let's assume it is for now, what species does it represent? Well, the, cat most, the species most associated with the Key Marco cat is the now endangered Florida panther, uh, which is the last surviving puma subspecies in the eastern United States and, of course, roamed uh, during the time of the Calusa and their ancestors. But... Um, more important are probably the physical attributes of the cat, if you look at it closely, uh, in determining its role or purpose in society, because uh, we've we got to look at those features that are considered anthropomorphic. Um, even from its posture to its extrem extremities, it does seem to exhibit some human-like qualities. Uh, and these you know, characteristics kind of indicate an extra level of importance to its maker uh, and to its end users. And so... Some have suggested that the figure may represent a literal depiction of a masked or costumed performer, uh, but others believe it to be in a state of transformation, uh, somewhere between a human and a panther, but not fully either. 
So stepping back a bit and looking at cats from a global you know, perspective, they've been the, the, the subject of countless works of art. Um, you know, in going back 30,000 years, they first appear in European cave art. There's a remarkable ivory carving, the Lohenmensch, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, um, in German. Um, it's a lion-human figure carved from a mammoth tusk and is now in a museum in Germany. Um, in ancient Egypt, of course, we're all probably familiar with big cats and domestic cats alike being worshipped as deities. Um, and since as early as 3100 BC, they've been in, uh, included in vast cat cemeteries and paintings and statuettes, which are very similar in form, uh, if you'll notice the cat on the left there, to the Key Marco cat. And that's probably the most famous cat figure in the world, the bronze Geyer Anderson cat, which is at the British Museum. Um, and uh, it dates to Egypt's late period and predates the earliest suggested date of the cat, the Key Marco cat, by about a thousand years. Um, and in other parts of the world, cats have long been associated with divinity as well. There's ancient sites in Turkey and Sumer and Crete, Greece and India. They've all had material culture indicating the importance of cats in society, uh, particularly big cats. And so it's probably unsurprising that Cushing, the archaeologist who found the Key Marco cat, immediately drew comparisons, uh, saying, nothing thus far found in America so vividly calls to mind the best art of the ancient Egyptians or Assyrians, as does the little statuette of the lion god. And as he points out, you know, known examples of ancient feline art are even more rare um, in the Americas than other parts of the world. Uh, and in North America, though, one of the best known feline depictions is in a steatite panther effigy, which is pictured on the right there. Uh, and that was a grape pipe found in Indiana and associated with the Allison or Copina culture and dates to about A.D. 100 to 500. So how was it used? Well, um, here in Florida, we have to turn to the ethno-historic and the ethnographic records for some ideas. Now, the Calusa, of course, and their ancestors didn't keep written records. So the only first-hand accounts from their time were written by Europeans, who were, in their descriptions, clearly prejudiced. Um, and while biased, they're still our best-known eyewitness accounts uh, of the Calusa, particularly when it comes to things like behavior and other um, uh, observations that aren't going to be immediately apparent in the archaeological record. Um, and so the most frequently cited ethno-historic account uh, associated with the cat comes from translations of a Spanish missionary's um, uh, recollections of interactions at Mount Key, the Calusa capital, in 1567. Father Juan Regal describes, quote, a temple of idols there, which were some very ugly masks, which some Indians donned, delegated by it, and they went out into the village with them, and the wretches performed their worship and adored them with the women singing certain canticles. And so the Key Marco cat may well have been one of these idols that uh, Regal mentions, making it an item of possible religious or spiritual importance. And anthropologists also look to the ethnographic record uh, for observations learned from living cultures, uh, for clues to the importance of the panther in modern Native American societies. And so there are so many avenues to go with this. I'll try to be very succinct. There are much more in the book than I'm going to go into here. But generally, in uh, southeastern tribes, the panther is portrayed as a dangerous creature in myths. And those myths usually relate to hunting or warfare. Uh, and these myths indicate that panthers hold special, special powers or knowledge that can sometimes be transmitted to humans. And Cushing, uh, his initial instincts about the cat fall in line with this idea. He says, quote, it's a fetish of God, fetish or God of war or the hunt. And uh, often in southeastern tribes, special, clan, uh, special offices or duties are held by members of certain clans. For example, the head medicine man for the Seminole always belongs to the panther clan. Uh, so if the cat represented a family group or a clan, for instance, perhaps it was an identifying symbol somewhere in the village or on the inside of a family's dwelling. 
Um, and in many native stories, panthers are the original ancestors of tribal clans and could travel actually between worlds, transforming between human and panther. Um, and again, often associated with warfare and sometimes even seen as protectors or guardian figures. And these creatures that alternate between animal and human uh, form are found in Cherokee and Creek and Seminole uh, stories. So again, those are just a few possibilities. Um, and there are more uh, outlined in the book. So chapter four, the moment of truth. It, uh, a defining moment in the cat's life probably was also an unexpected one. And that was the moment when it was suddenly deposited into the muck that wound up preserving it for centuries on Marco Island. And its deposition may have been the result of accidental or even tragi tragic circumstances. We don't know. Uh, and as if the cause weren't mysteri mysterious enough on its own, we, don't, we know even less about when that might have happened. Uh, was it 500 years ago? Was it 1,500 years ago? Was it somewhere in between? Um, did the cat go into the muck on the same day or at the same moment? as the thousand other artifacts that were found at the site? Or was it deposited individually, perhaps even intentionally? We don't know. Uh, the chapter that follows outlines the various means and methods through which archaeologists have attempted to ascribe an age to the key Marco cat and the other artifacts, as well as the possible causes of their deposition. So, one of the major unknowns, of course, is how it wound up in the muck that preserved it. And there are four major theories. Uh, the first being the hurricane or storm theory. Uh, the second being uh, some sort of fire event. The third being fleeing invasion. Uh, or the fourth being facing invasion. And these theories all have one thing in common, which was eventual abandonment of the site by its residents. Um, and most of the artifacts actually seem to be still in functional or aesthetically pr pristine condition uh, when found, leaving one to question why they would be left behind. And there are also no canoes found at the site, uh, which kind of indicates that people hightailed it out of there at some point. So when Cushing excavated uh, Key Marco in 1896, he and his crew found important objects like masks and figureheads, perfect condition scattered across more than 8,000 square feet, um, so perhaps uh, the prevailing theory is that a dramatic storm surge uh, enveloped the site, depositing all the objects into a low-lying cavity and sealing them in for centuries. And Cushing and others think that's exactly what happens. Uh, but of course, there is always some complicating factor. And in this case, there was evidence of fire actually found on some of the artifacts, uh, which makes, makes that uh, a little bit suspect. And so... Uh, the most likely alternative to a natural storm-induced deposition is one caused by human activity, perhaps, as I said, from uh, facing an invasion of a hostile agent, maybe a warring tribe or European invaders, um, uh, and maybe they fled the location, burning the village behind them, or perhaps the invaders burned the village to the ground, um, or maybe it had nothing to do with Europeans at all. It might have been some sort of punishment handed down from the Calusa capital uh, at Mount Key for perceived disobedience or switching allegiances. As I mentioned, you know, around 1350, that sounded like there was some uh, political realignment going on with the Musba uh, and the Calusa. Uh, so these and several other theories, again, are you know in greater detail in the book. But the most popular theory is the hurricane one, and that's what I happen to believe ha happened as well. So when did this happen? Or in other words, how old is that cat? Well, there are a few things to consider. Most of the artifacts came from a single layer. Um, and so that makes most, theoretically, most of them, uh, if not all of them, contemporaneous, meaning they all went into the muck at the same time. Um, most notably, no European goods were found at, at the site during the excavation, which seems to indicate that it's pre-Columbian, or in other words, dates prior to European contact, about 1513. Um, most of Cushing's Key Marco bowls and pot shirts indicate a later date based on the designs that are found um, somewhere between 1200 and 1513. Um, but, of course, there's always a but. Later archaeologists have found a variety of earlier glades types at uh, the larger Key Marco site because he excavated only a small portion of it. 
1896. And that points to a much broader occupation of the site beginning at roughly AD 500. So uh, for example, in 2014, we re reconstructed three uh, nearly complete ceramic vessels, one of which you see on the right there, uh, and submitted them for radiocarbon analysis. There was food residue still on the inside of the bowl. And um, all of the dates for those vessels came back between 640 and 775, so a pretty tight window uh, and very early. Um, and um, of course, there were also radiocarbon dates done on other Key Marco artifacts in the late 60s and early 70s, and those ranged uh, even further apart from 55 to about 1670. 55 AD, I should say, to 1670. And most of them, though, fall between 600 and 900, which kind of aligns with the dates we got back uh, from the bulls. And so, uh, but of course, one archaeologist um, challenged these radiocarbon dates, calling them greatly in error because they were potentially contaminated by pesticides used in museum storage, which is common practice um, in museums. And so even the radiocarbon dates which you would think would be, you know, scientific fact are highly controversial in, in these circles. So clearly there are uh, quite a few differences in thought about uh, how old the Key Marco artifacts are, and that in turn makes it difficult to ascribe a cultural affiliation. So um, while the age of the cat itself is unknown, it's at least 500 years old and possibly up to 1,000 years old or so, 1,500 years old. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, when Ponce de Leon first reached the Gulf Coast of Florida, the cat was probably sitting beneath the surface at what is now Marco Island, and it would continue to sit there for another 382 years until its recovery in March 1896. That's more than five times the average global lifespan and probably closer to ten times the average lifespan of the Calusa uh, people uh, that lived at Key Marco. And so generations of people came and lived upon and left Marco's shores during those intervening years, all of which the cat silently survived under the ground and actually changed metaphorical hands five times, be belonging uh, technically to four different governments. That's how long it was under the ground. So <clears throat> the Calusa people, you know, continued to traverse the shell mounds and the sand hills of Muspa for another two centuries. But by the mid 18th century, the combination of disease and warfare and slavery uh, and displacement proved too much to overcome. And they had no guns to repel enemy invaders. And even in the most formidable weapons, of course, didn't defend against disease. Uh, so more than a century would pass between the last Calusa exodus from Florida in the 1670, 1760s, excuse me and the arrival of W.T. Collier, who was Marco Island's first pioneer settler in 1870. And though quiet by comparison to the, the periods it was sandwiched in between, uh, this forgotten century on Marco Island was really fundamental to its transition from a prominent Calusa town to an industrious pioneer settlement on the American frontier. Uh, and of course, its development ultimately is what resulted in the discovery of the Key Marco cat. So while wars were raging and boundaries were changing and storms were wreaking havoc on the coastline, uh, the Key Marco cat and its artifactual cohort sat virtually undisturbed in an anaerobic condition environment uh, for nearly 400 years. Um, and the finds, of course, seem miraculous, and in a sense they are, but well-known scientific properties uh, are what really resulted in their preservation. And uh, Cushing, uh, he wrote about, quote, an exceedingly foul-smelling level um, at the site. You can imagine how pleasant the working conditions would have been. Uh, it smelled like rotten eggs. And that's consistent with the presence of hydrogen sulfide, which can only exist in the absence of oxygen uh, and is often a telltale indicator of a waterlogged or wet site. And so rotting organic material gradually de depletes the uh, layer's oxygen and prohibits bacterial growth and enables the formation of this hydrogen sulfide gas. Um, and the formation of an oxygen-free environment is really the single most important con condition of several that help preserve the Key Marco artifacts, inhibiting that bacteria that would ordinarily cause dis dis um, decay 
and there's other factors outlined in the book. Um, but you know, since most of the key marker artifacts were made of perishable materials like wood and plant fiber, they offer us the most complete known representation of material culture in pre-Columbian Florida. Had they not been protected by this unusual combination of muck and peat and marl and shell, they would have decomposed in a matter of weeks or months. So chapter six, the uh, circumstances that led to the discovery of the key marker cat are really the stuff of legend. Uh, there's so many coincidences and serendipitous turns of events that it sometimes reads like a work of fiction. And the archeologist's exciting road to glory is often told, but in truth, the less heralded journey from Florida uh, back to the Smithsonian was far more treacherous to the object itself. It was recovered uh, you know, from the safe confines of its oxygen-free environment where it was uh, very comfortable and, uh, and then thrust into this world where uh, it was relying on people who were totally unprepared <laughs> to care for it. And so not only was Cushing hard pressed to figure out a way to prevent the artifacts from deteriorating on the spot, he then had to figure out how to ship them safely more than 900 miles, this is in 1896, back to the museums in Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. So there were 70 days between its discovery and its arrival at the Smithsonian, and those were some of the most perilous days of its very long life. Now, Frank Cushing, he was a well-known anthropologist in the late 1800s. He was often described as a genius by his peers. Um, he was hired at age 19 as a curator for the Smithsonian. Uh, he's probably best well known for his ethnographic field work with the Zuni, uh, during which he became one of the most, uh, or one of the first practitioners of what's called participant observation, uh, where you actually learn about another culture by living and taking part in it. Uh, and he had more experience as an ethnographer than as an archaeologist, but his excavation techniques at Key Marco were actually rather innovative for the time. Um, and they lack detail by today's standards, but his grid system that he created uh, provided some context to certain artifacts and features. And uh, he was also the first anthropologist to note this really dynamic relationship between culture and environment that archaeologists are still studying today. So as I mentioned, the Court of the Pile Dwellers was the name that Cushing bestowed upon the site at Key Marco. Uh, it was so called because he believed the uh, occupants once built their homes along its shores and on top of the shell mounds and ridges there. And they uncovered more than a thousand artifacts, uh, painted wooden masks, carved animal figureheads, netting, cordage, atlatls, shark tooth sabers, and a huge assortment of utilitarian tools, uh, wooden objects, centuries old and probably well preserved. There's some pictures of them there and also the working conditions. Um, and the result is really this spectacular assemblage of Native American artifacts that to this day offer us unparalleled insight into Florida's native people. Um, and the water court that he excavated, which was a highly saturated low-lying area between a couple of shell benches, uh, was a common feature of other sites in Southwest Florida and have been studied recently by archeologists and may well have actually been used as a fish trap or a live fish storage area that they would have closed off with netting uh, to keep their fish surplus uh, alive until they needed it. And, uh, but still no other water courts excavated have yielded such a prolific archeological assemblage as what was found at Key Marco. So when they broke the seal of this muck at Key Marco, some of the objects disintegrated almost immediately. Um, roughly a quarter of all the perishable artifacts were destroyed during the excavation, and less than half actually retained their original form for more than a few days. Many of them were really indistinguishable from the mud, which they dug with their hands and garden tools um, and turned to mush as soon as they uncovered them. And so, Thankfully, Cushing enlisted the help of a young, talented artist named Wells Sawyer. Um, and not only did he photograph many of the artifacts soon after they were excavated, he also painted beautiful watercolors of the most noteworthy specimens, um, depicting them in their colorized states, because of course, um, color photography didn't exist at the time. And so his uh, images are really our only record of what these artifacts looked like in their original pristine condition. 
uh, but many are now damaged beyond recognition. And so March 5th, 1896, that was the day the Key Marco cat was found, and it really couldn't have come at a better time for Cushing and Sawyer. They were both struggling with anxiety and depression, which I go into in, in detail in the book, but um, it was really becoming a sputtering expedition, and their luck really turned on a dime in early March when they started finding these amazing artifacts, including the cat. Uh, and you can tell by their comments about the object just how much they thought of it. Um, and Cushing, in his report on March 5th, he called that, quote, a happy day. So one of the most pivotal periods of the cat's life was its transfer, transportation over 900 miles from Marco, Florida, to Washington, D.C. during 1896. So when the excavation was over, the artifacts actually sat in the hull of a ship, the Silver Spray, uh, as its crew worked its way back up the southwest Florida coast. And at one point, a storm actually swept the ship off of its anchor out into sea, prompting a dramatic rescue of its contents, including the cat. Um, and then most of the artifacts were then sent by train from Tarpon Springs to Philadelphia. But Cushing actually decided to personally courier two boxes separately. And so according to the original field packing lists, a majority of the most spectacular objects were in those two boxes, including the cat. Um, so instead of going to Philly, it actually went to D.C. with Cushing, rode shotgun with him. And although it eventually found its way to Philly, before Cushing uh, requested it back on loan to D.C. in 1898. So it likely underwent five relocations in less than two years, from Marco to Tarpon Springs to Washington, D.C., to Haven, Maine, for a whole other reason, to Philadelphia, and then back to Washington, D.C. again, all before becoming even an official museum object, uh, enduring more than 2,000 miles of travel by boat and rail for sure, and probably horse-drawn carriage and foot. Uh, and amazingly, it, it survived all of those uh, adventures unscathed. So finding a forever home. So people have been caring for the cat for hundreds of years now, from its source community, where it may have been anointed with the fat of slain animals, to its plush archival storage box at the Smithsonian's Department of Anthropology. And it is a plush box. My cat would have loved to have sat in that box. Uh, if anybody else has cats, I'm sure they feel the same. Uh, people have gone to great lengths to keep this cat happy and healthy. Uh, now, the lives of most museum objects are usually low-key and uneventful, and they're often in storage longer than they're on display. Um, they're occasionally inspected, less occasionally treated uh, for conservation. Uh, and there's some objects, though, that lead an abnormally busy collections life, and the cat is one of them. And this period between 1896 and 1908 uh, was particularly crucial to the cat's story uh, which was a time of uncertainty as it made the gradual transition from field site to museum accession log. So practically from the moment Cushing returned from Florida, he was distracted by illness, financial troubles, and even accusations of fraud. And you combine this with a toxic blend of politics and scandal and death, and the final disposition of the artifacts would take more than a decade to resolve. When the cat was loaned back to Cushing, as I said, at the Smithsonian in 1898, along with a number of other artifacts, he actually devised a numbering system that would allow him to divide the collection as equally as possible between the two institutions. Uh, and there were basically two series of numbers, one designated to the Penn Museum and one designated to the Smithsonian. And interestingly, he actually intended for the cat to live in perpetuity at the Penn Museum. However, he died in 1900 at just at the age of 42 before the final division could be made. So that left the fate of the objects in limbo. And so with his death, they really hit a major setback in the division of the artifacts. The, the major problem was the unique nature uh, of so many of the finds. They originally agreed in writing to divide them equally between the two museums, one of them which uh, funded the expedition, the other Cushing was the curator for. 
Um, and that was just an impossible task given the nature of the artifacts, all of which were completely unique. Um, so it also appears, though, that he promised the Penn Museum the most full and complete specimens, probably because they were the ones that funded it. Um, but the Smithsonian had no idea about these oral agreements between, between him and the Penn Museum, and so they argued back and forth of the, over the agreement and the artifacts for months after Cushing died, all while those loaned to Cushing remained in Washington. And so in April 1901, they made a list of specimens they intended to keep at the Smithsonian, and this is that list. Uh, and on the otherwise typewritten list, handwritten in ink, seemingly as an afterthought, is item 790, panther-headed figure in the bottom right there. And that's the Key Marco cat. So the Penn Museum, when they got this list, they happened to notice that the cat was on there. And they weren't too happy about it. So they wrote a letter asking to cross out the Key Marco cat, quote, as a personal favor. Naturally, the Smithsonian politely refused. And that was that. Uh, so it decided the long-term fate of the cat as a museum object added to the list basically because the secretary at the Smithsonian um, at the time really liked the object a lot and wanted it included. And there's a whole back and forth correspondence that's really fascinating uh, that goes along with that. And so um, despite this resolution, you know, in 1901, another seven years would pass between uh, that and when the cat was formally accessioned into the collection. So chapter eight. Um, you know, the cat's really unique in that it, it's an object at one of the formative institutions in the history of American anthropology, and it witnessed many changes to the discipline firsthand. You know, as an anthropological artifact, it's one of the best known constants through which we can examine changing museum practices over the past century, um, because it's had a surprisingly lengthy exhibition history. Um, one of the biggest complaints that I got when I was first starting on Marco Island was that the cat was locked away in a drawer and they don't want anybody to see it. Uh, well, and I had no information to argue otherwise at the time, but in doing the research for this book, I found that that was actually, uh, it was quite the opposite. Um, you know, and, and for, for good reason, some people, you know, would think that because most museums exhibit only a small percentage of their collections at any given time. And most, if are uh, hardly ever, you know, even put on exhibit uh, or researched even during a span of 100 years. Um, but as this chapter illustrates, the length of the cat being on exhibition likely exceeds more than 60% of its century plus as a collection's object. So this is the earliest known photo of the Key Marco artifacts on exhibit. It's from the United States National Museum, now the Natural History Museum. If you've ever been to see the Hope Diamond, you've been in this building. Um, and back then it was common practice for museums, even the best ones, to display their objects in what we call cabinets of curiosity, uh, where many artifacts as possible are basically crammed into a space with little to no interpretation and presented more as curios or oddities uh, than material evidence of the past. And so this photo dates to March 1956, and it's very possible that the key marker artifacts were on display here from the very beginning, about 1913, until when and after this picture was taken. And if you look closely, I think you can see what is the key Marco cat with its familiar profile in the top there in the red circle. Um, and it's on display in that case. And so it's kind of frightening to think about, especially if you're a museum professional, uh, with all of that natural light you see pouring in from the windows, which can really damage fragile materials, especially those made of wood. And it, it's possible that these objects were on display here for as many as 45 to 50 years in these cases. So we know the exhibits were modernized and, uh, in 1962, and it reopened at the Smithsonian as part of the North American Archaeology exhibit. It was in the Woodcarvers of Southern Florida case, um, alongside other artifacts from Key Marco and, and other locations in Florida, all of which were attributed to the Calusa. So that's the first major difference here. There's some interpretation an attribution to a specific cultural group. And amazingly, the cat sat in this display case for another 21 years until at least March 1984. 
And here we are in 1985. The Key Marco Cat since 1985 has been incorporated into seven different exhibits at 11 different locations across the country. Uh, this particular exhibition, it went from the National Gallery of Art to Detroit to Houston. Um, and this exhibit was different in that it presented uh, this material from an art historical pers perspective. And this is my favorite exhibit. Uh, the next one that it appears in is Circa 1492, one of the most ambitious museum exhibitions ever orchestrated in North America, uh, built to commemorate the 500th anniversary of Christopher Columbus, his arrival in the Americas. Uh, one of the first to look at uh, history globally during a specific window in time. This exhibit had objects on loan from Queen Elizabeth. There were works by da Vinci, Michelangelo, other European Renaissance artists, and the cat was the only one requested from the Natural History Museum, making it really selected as a representative work, not only of Florida, but of all of North, South, and Central America. And more than half a million people saw this exhibit on display uh, between October and January, just three months. Now, three years after that, it appeared in a much more uh, simple and locally focused historical exhibition at the Collier County Museum in Naples, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Cushing Expedition. Um, and it was its first ever return to Florida and the first of two visits to its native Collier County in less than five years. Uh, and about 37,000 people saw it in uh, about six months in Naples. And this is the wildest loan that it's been on uh, part of. It was brought actually to Marco Island in 1999 by the Marco Island Historical Society, who I work for now. And it was brought to a bank. And uh, it was brought back to Marco Island for the first time in more than 100 years, a limited millennium exhibition. So it went, you know, crossed over successfully through Y2K, uh, just a mile from where it was originally found and drew about 18,000 visitors. And they had to wheel it into the bank vault every night. Uh, and it was an old Beanie Babies display case. Um, and ultimately, and I can't believe this exhibit actually happened, but um, ultimately it proved more successful as a marketing tactic than anything else because there was uh, this burgeoning movement on the island at the time for building a new historical museum, and this was really the thing that kicked off uh, that momentum. And here you see it in another exhibit that was at the Art Institute of Chicago. It went to St. Louis and then back to the Smithsonian. Um, you know, and this was uh, one of the first exhibits in which Native American uh, scholars and perspectives were really at the core of the interpretation of the cat. It was very similar to the 85 exhibit, but had more uh, diverse input into the content and the interpretation. And then in September 2010, the Peabody Essex Museum took the cat into another art exhibition. Uh, this one, you know, actually was even more progressive. They gave credit to the individual artists um, and provided a uh, native explanation for the carving's inspiration. Um, quote, panthers, indigenous to what is now Florida, uh, would likely have inspired native artists to create their likeness. Additionally, native people of southeastern North America, among others, have in their oral histories the Thunderbirds, uh, who rule the upper world, and the underwater panthers, who rule the watery lower world, in this world order that's kept in balance by the two. And these Animal human beings are continually at war, not only to maintain the balance between the worlds, uh, but also between the elements of fire and water. Uh, and so this was a really uh, progressive exhibit and also was the first to kind of acknowledge the uncertainties, you know, over its age that we talked about as well. And then you have our exhibit at the Marco Island Historical Museum, which was nowhere near as philosophically as advanced as those uh, wonderful exhibits put together earlier. Um, but one of the key differences for us was trying to make the objects more accessible and engaging uh, and relatable to our visitors. So, um, you know, and that's really one of the main focuses of museum exhibits today is trying to blend education and entertainment successfully in a way that people uh, really take something away from their experience. Uh, whether it be interactive or participatory. Um, and so for us, that meant uh, including things like a 
Calusa pottery puzzle, a uh, coloring corner or a craft corner where Calusa masks can be colored. We have a little block of wood that weighs the same amount as the cat so you can pick it up and kind of experience what it might be like to hold it in your hands. Um, I'm just trying to present new ways to think about and interact with the same old objects. Uh, uh, and just as an example of how far we've come since that early curio case with all the light pouring in, the Smithsonian has even created a 3D scan of the cat, which you can go online and download. And if you have a printer at home, you can print out your own exact replica of the Key Marco cat. Uh, so as you've seen, you know, the cat through its participation in all these exhibits for the past hundred years is really a living demonstration of these changing practices in anthropology and uh, museum studies and, uh, you know, the fields evolve around it and it stays the same. And so it'll be interesting to see how the cat is interpreted in the future uh, as it's incorporated into new exhibits. And so we're getting there, we're almost done. Mm -hmm. We're on chapter nine, uh, national treasure. So the cat has had a lot of special treatment over the years. As I said, it was personally couriered near the, nearly a thousand miles uh, when it was found by the archeologists who found it. It's been adored and protected by its museum caretakers of all generations as is evident in the correspondence at the various museums. Uh, it's been stored separately away from the rest of the Smithsonian's Key Marco collection for a long time in a safe uh, at various times since 1908. And uh, it's been featured in numerous exhibitions and publications as we've seen. And uh, it's just been in the spotlight more than most other works of art or mother, more, most other artifacts. And you, know, you combine that with all of its incredible preservation, the amazing mysteries surrounding it, the uh, unusual level of public attention and the brilliance and controversy of the archeologist who found it. Uh, and it's really become a modern day cultural icon. So the Marco Island Historical Museum uh, used, you know, we used this cat's return on loan in those two loans you saw previously as a fundraising platform. And eventually uh, the Historical Society raised about four and a half million dollars to build this Marco Island Historical Museum, which opened full-time in 2011. Um, the exterior of the building is actually designed to resemble the wood pile-dwelling structures that Cushing so vividly imagined. Um, it was actually even designed specifically, it is very ambitious, specifically with the return of the cat in mind. Um, they built a secure central display vault as the crowning architectural feature of the building. Um, and a six foot tall bronze statue of the cat outside in the courtyard, which you can see in the picture there. Um, and so they were, you know, from the outset, the goal was to eventually get the cat on loan back to this museum. And so in 2018, we finally came to a formal uh, commitment um, with the Smithsonian and we underwent the process of preparing uh, the museum for this loan and others from the Penn Museum. And, um, they were to be on display from December 2018 through April 2021, uh, which is a period of 28 months, which actually marked the longest single loan of the cat to any institution uh, outside the Smithsonian. So we absorbed a direct hit from Hurricane Irma in 2017. It made landfall right on Marco Island. Um, and it was a really good test for our museum. Uh, because at that point we were still in talks with the Smithsonian about getting the cat on loan. Um, and afterward, we were very fortunate. We didn't have much damage at all, uh, just to some trees outside in the parking lot. And so we felt confident that with a few upgrades, we could really safely accommodate these artifacts even during hurricane season. Um, so what we had to do was we installed a network of security cameras. We got new display cases. We got a sophisticated new alarm system. We got a backup generator, which you can see being lowered in by crane in the top picture there, that would power the museum and its HVAC system in the event of a power loss. Uh, and we also had to hire a full-time security guard. And uh, of course, the most important stipulation of the loan agreement is, uh, had to do with the environmental conditions. We had to make sure we maintain the temperature, relative humidity and light levels all to a certain degree, even the event of extreme power loss. Um, and combined, 
our two organizations, the county and the historical society that worked together to run the museum spent upwards of a million dollars on the project. And that's a crazy amount of money. Uh, some might say crazy, especially to bring back one six inch tall little cat. Um, but it's all to say that, you know, thanks to the cat, not only did the museum exhibits and facilities receive permanent improvements that will hopefully pay dividends for years, we really raised our standards across the board at the museum. Um, in the long run, that'll hopefully benefit the public that we serve as well as the museum uh, and also the thousands of other ar artifacts and materials that we preserve every day at the Marco Allen Historical Museum. So still I get asked all the time, you know, was it all worth it? A million dollars is a lot of money. And we're a very small institution. We have four full-time employees. And uh, for our little museum, though, the impact of the cat loan was undeniable. Um, as you can see, we smashed our annual visitation record by more than 15,000 people in 2019. Um, of course, that's really dropped off precipitously between uh, 2020 and 2021 due to COVID. Um, uh, but still, we've also helped raise the profile of the museum, increased its credibility, increased awareness of Native American history and culture on Marco Island and in Florida generally. Uh, and it had a pretty big impact on tourism in Collier County. Uh, and there's some figures there that help support that. A study was done in 2018. Um, and really, many local residents take pride in the CAD as a source of local identity now. Um, and so its commodification you know, really helps build community and also generates that revenue that Marco Island's seasonally, uh, tourist, seasonal tourist-driven economy keeps it afloat. Um, and, you know, I've seen the cat all over the place, in coffee shops, um, in street parades, in ice sculptures, and even in hotel banquets. So really, to put it simply, um, you know, the cat sells. Uh, and, you know, it's become so well known that it was even featured on a 1989 postage stamp, which you can see on the top left there. Um, and uh, as a symbol of regional history and culture, it's really, you know, the cat in particular, but all of the Key Marco iconography have been found throughout Florida. I've seen them at uh, museums from the Keys to Sanibel Island, from Tallahassee down to Naples. Um, it's really become more than just an artifact. It's, it's become a symbol of Florida's Native American history and heritage. And so, um, you know, to sum it up, the cat really offers us a fascinating case study uh, of the power of a single object uh, and how that power can change um, or transform over time. And, uh, you know, this small wooden carving, which was probably carved centuries ago, by an artist and, and communally admired uh, for probably its spiritual connotations above all else, now is this iconic symbol of Florida's pre-Columbian Native American people having traveled about 12,000 miles since it was excavated, capable of moving millions of dollars in its use as an educational and promotional tool. Uh, it's produced jobs, it's contributed to people's careers, um, in a sense, you know, we really worship the cat in a new and different way uh, that obviously was probably far different than was originally intended when they made this thing so long ago, uh, which to me is all just very interesting to think about. So what's next for the cat? Uh, we really don't know, to be honest. You know, it's going to be returning home in 2026. Uh, it's obviously a hot commodity. It, it probably needs a, a little bit of a cat nap after all of the traveling it's been doing. And I, I expect it'll be exhibited sometime again. I was thinking on the way up here, wouldn't it be cool to uh, have it on display with all those other examples of cat artwork from around the world? That might be a cool exhibit for a larger institution to do. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, you know, I'll just keep researching other artifacts at the Penn Museum. Hopefully um, we'll have some new articles coming out in the next couple of years. But, um, that's the really exciting thing about museum collections, and there's always more to learn from them, um, you know, especially as new ideas and technologies continue to emerge, and uh, we continue to build off what others have done in the past. And so that's why it's so important that we continue to preserve uh, and, uh, and share these fragile artifacts, you know, with uh, the utmost care so that they can be preserved and enjoyed 
uh, and learned from by future generations. And so uh, the Key Marco artifacts and the Key Marco Cat in particular are really great examples of that. So if you're interested in learning more, I'll do a shameless plug for my book. Uh, obviously, it'll include some of what you've heard today in, in much more detail than I was able to fit in uh, in just an hour. Hopefully, it was only an hour. Um, and it's available now on the University of Press of Florida website, uh, as well as others. You can just Google it. It's also available here in the uh, museum gift shop. Um, so with that, um, that's pretty much all I've got. I, I want to thank you all so much for joining me today. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about our museum, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, or at our website, or visit us in person. We're open Tuesday through Saturday from 9 to 4. Uh, admission is free even to see the Key Marco Cat. So uh, I want to thank you all so much again for coming. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions that you may have. Yes, yes, sir. Explore in other sites in Florida, other Native American sites in Florida. He did, yes. Actually, his uh, trip to Key Marco was delayed uh, for a while. At one point, he left in 1895 and didn't arrive in Marco until about February 1896 because the schooner that he was supposed to rent was off on a sponging excursion. And so he was not one to just sit around and do nothing, so he actually excavated um, some mounds. Uh, I believe there were Safford Mound and Hope Mound uh, up in the Tarpon Springs area, which are really spectacular archaeological collections in their own right uh, now at the Smithsonian Institution. And so, and he also visited, you know, uh, excuse me, uh, sites all across southwest Florida. He liked to go and investigate, walk to the top of mounds and envision the landscape and um, and so he made notes about that in his journals uh, as well. And there, you can actually buy, uh, uh, they published his journals a few years ago, so you can actually go read through his experiences uh, as he goes day to day throughout southwest Florida, uh, identifying all of these different archaeological sites, including uh, Key Marco. So, what, yes, ma'am. Was I correct that you said they don't know the wood? Yes, that, that's right. Why aren't, I mean, with DNA or, I mean, can they figure it out or nobody wants to scratch it? Or? Nobody wants to scratch it is the easy answer. Okay. Um, but yeah, you, you, the best way to do it would be to take a thin section and look at it under a microscope and look at the cellular structure. But of course, they're not going to allow that to happen. I've had one person um, who's an expert in wood identification say that it's possible to use a handheld lens and look at it, but she hasn't been down to see it in person. So, um, but yeah, it's it's one of those things. It's it's like you, it's so simple. It's right in front of you, and you really would love love an answer. And and actually, it's been reported probably erroneously, uh, maybe not, but as buttonwood. So you see that a lot in I've seen it in uh, news articles uh, online, and it's sort of uh, taken on a life of its own. And so. Um, now a lot of people I just identify it as buttonwood, but it's not necessary. It could be, it could well be buttonwood, but um, not necessarily. So, yeah, I'd love to know. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, gumbo limbo trees found on all Indian mounds. Uh, gumbo limbo trees grow really well on Indian mounds. That's one of the. Um, I, I know arch I'm not an archaeologist, but I know archaeologists <laughs> look for those trees specifically because of how well they grow in the soil, something to do with the composition of it from all of that shell. Um, so if you go, one great place to see that is the Randell Research Center on Pine Island. Uh, it's one of the few places you can go and see uh, what a Calusa site, you know, is largely undisturbed, undeveloped, uh, what the Calusa landscape would have looked like. There's actually remnants of a canal there that was hand dug by the Calusa and also shell mounds that you can climb to the top of. Uh, it's really a, a unique uh, experience um, and I would highly recommend doing that. Uh, the Randell Research Center, it's on Pine Island. Uh, yeah, Pine Island. It's the north end near Boquilia. You got questions in the back there? Yeah. Did Cushing's time in Marco Island include the Great Freeze of 1896? 
Uh, that's a good question. When was the Great Freeze of 1896? <laughs> he got there in uh, February, so we know the exact date. I can't think of the date off the top of my head, but he was there through March and then into April, so if it happened during that time, then he <laughs> may well likely have experienced that. But he doesn't mention that. I don't remember him mentioning that in any of his uh, diaries or journals, so he, pr he probably would have. So maybe it was just a little after that. But again, I don't know when, when the freeze was. Any other questions? No? Okay, well, thank you all so much. This was a great uh, opportunity for me. I really appreciate speaking with you. And thanks for coming out tonight so much. I did, yeah. Isn't that exciting? They found the lost... Uh